Dune 2 has finally came out and hit theaters, and that means it's time for me to talk about my spoiler thoughts on this amazing, not great, but good second movie. I want you to know I will love you as long as I breathe. Now, when I came out with my regular non-spoiler review, I it was a lot I wanted to talk about, but I didn't want to get into too many details because I didn't want to spoil this movie for anybody else. I had a lot of friends and family who were looking forward to Dune 2, and my grievances, per se, were not things that I feel like I could get into without spoiling context. Now, I know these are books, and I know people are out there who have read them and know the story, but not everybody is that way, and not every adaption is going to be exactly the same as a book. But And I'm somebody who hasn't read the book, so I don't know what's right and what's wrong. But when it comes to the reasons why I am not the biggest lover of this movie, I think it's a very good movie. I think that it is very good, and there's a lot to talk about it in positive ways, and we'll get that started here soon. But there's also going to be a lot of sections where I talk about areas where I think it was weak, and it lacks substance, and really what I would consider solid writing. But let's leave that for later. Let's start out with the good of Dune 2. So first up, the positives you have to say is it's a beautifully shot movie. I've seen it now twice in IMAX. I made it a point before my spoiler review to give this a second watch. And how beautiful this movie is on the big screen is probably the number one big win. All the battle and action sequences, whether it's the gladiator pit, whether it's every time the Fremen are taking on the Harkonnens all the way throughout... This movie delivers a beautiful aesthetic. Even all the times when you see the worms about just the average landscape of Arachnus in, in, in this movie, and you know, it's just beauty shots. And what I love most about it is there are sequences where it's darker and it's more nighttime, but like scenes like Paul's first worm ride is so bright and it feels so just beautiful and you can see everything clearly that's something that we get away from with movies nowadays there's a lot of movies that have a darker tone that try to use the darker tone to make it easier for cgi dune part two had its darker shots but it had its very bright shots it had its shots that were in like bright daylight and again Paul riding the worm for the first time is the perfect example of that when you see that in the movie theaters you're it is like you're, what, you're in the desert, you know, you're on the dunes, and it's just a bright yellow, something that I feel like the first movie was lacking. And when it comes to the action sequences, I think when we got a chance to see them, they were so superbly choreographed, and the visuals that were taking place with the fighting and everything was just so well done. Again, whether it's the Fremen killing out Harkonnen scouts, the Fremen taking down Spice um, miners per se, or Fade Ma Rothra going in his gladiator fight. And when we talk about fights, the Polytrades and, and Freud Ma Fade Mothras, Fade Rothras, uh, I apologize with these names. I'm trying to remember them in my head at the same time. But Fade Rothra and Polytrades' fin final fight there, I think was just great hand to hand combat. And as an action set piece goes, it works very well as a climactic finale, per se. Um, the brief sequences we see of the final fight between the Emperor's army and the Fremen Atreides group, again, was super, super great. Seeing the worms in action, seeing the the explosions take place. The, mutual, the movie is so beautiful. Hans Zimmer's score matches the tone throughout the whole entire movie as well. This is a beautifully scored movie, and it wouldn't surprise me if come Oscars next year, it's going to win that category as well. I think this movie is going to carry up cinematography, costume design, score, sound. Most of the major tech categories, Dune Part 2 is likely to win come next March, about a year's time. Um, it probably would have done pretty well this year in those categories. I don't know if it would have won anything in terms of Best Picture or anything like that. I think Oppenheimer would have had that sewn up pretty far. But it definitely would have won a lot of the crafty awards and would have taken a big hit off Oppenheimer's total. Now, let's start talking about the characters. The character I think I love the most is Shani. Not Chanti, like I said in the non-spoiler review. 
Johnny, played by Zendaya. Johnny is this amazing character portrayed by Zendaya, who I, I, Zendaya does not get enough credit in a lot of the things that she's in. She's so young, but she's so talented and great. I easily see her having an Emma Stone type trajectory in these next decade or so, where I wouldn't be surprised, like Emma Stone is being talked about for a second Oscar before she turns 40, if Zendaya finds herself in that position over the next couple of decades. I think, she, again, she's amazing in this movie. And Shawnee is my favorite character of the movie because she is fully realized. I, I understand where she's at. I understand her motivations and her connections to Paul, what she loves about him, what he what she also worries about him. You know, her care for her people, her care for her world. Johnny hits all these emotional beats and you see the struggles in her. And, you know, the big conflict that I also do like when it comes to the Fremen, which is the religious conflict, how, you know, she's very anti-religious. She feels that the religion and the prophecy is used to control the Fremen. And, and I honestly would agree when you know the backstory with the Bene Gesserit and you see in the movie, she's kind of right on the money with that. And again, Zendaya's character is able to deliver a amazing overall arc. Her chemistry with Paul and Timothy Chalamet, I think, was pretty decent overall. And when you get near the end of the movie and you're seeing the change in Paul Atreides, and I'll get into Paul Atreides here soon because that's a character I loved and I disliked in this movie. And it's one of the reasons why I'm not calling this a great movie. But it's Chani is a character I feel who I understand as an individual through the whole entire movie. Her writing is very well done. The acting, even when, when she doesn't have lines, just her acting with her eyes and her facial expressions is able to tell so much about that character that I think could have easily been forgotten if it wasn't acted as well as it was by Zendaya. Um, a character as well. I also liked a lot was um, lady Jessica. Again, the more religious aspect of th this crew, you have her becoming the Reverend mother and the w water of life sequence was very like, disturbing in a way for both Paul and Lady Jessica, but the way she was acting afterwards and the way that Rebecca Ferguson was able to hold that like religious zealot knowing tone and her communicating with her fetus daughter per se and making it not seem weird and not seem out of place in the movie is so well realized and so well done. She has a purpose and I understand her character arcs throughout and what she's doing, she's not as present in the movie as most of the other characters, but she is truly in a belief sense that she's doing the right thing for, for Paul and for her family. And I just think that character, even with its flaws, um, in terms of it good or bad with that, I felt like she was fully realized and I could understand where she came from. And she felt very again, consistent in terms of like, I just understood her point of view throughout the whole entire movie, pre-drinking the water of life and post-drinking the water of life, all that stuff. Another character I like to talk about was Stilgar, played by Javier Bardem, and he plays this leader of the Fremen's core that you're having with Tim and Chalamet. And his being able to balance wanting Paul to prove himself to the Fremen as an individual, but also being a super religious believer that Paul is this chosen prophet is just so well realized by Javier Bardem. He brings a lot of the comedic value throughout the whole entire movie, but he also shows so much hope and passion in his eyes that Paul is this chosen being. And he plays a great foil to Zendaya, who is playing more fundamentalist. Like this is how you, you know, this, this prophecy is how they control us. And he's saying, no, the prophecy is this real religious thing. And I think Javier Bardem deserves a lot of praise for Stilgar's role and his acting throughout. And when he questions things, when he doesn't question things, how he tells Lady Jessica in the very beginning of the movie, like, hey, you can either become the Reverend Mother or you don't become it and the prophecy isn't true. So here, we're just going to throw you and your son out into the desert to die. And... It's just th that perfect religious fanaticism. Um, 
Now, I'm going to leave a couple other characters for later on, but let's talk about the early just fan, uh, uh, fanaticism and just it's how it, I think it works well in this movie. I think as a storyline, this is probably the best story beat, and depending on how it goes in maybe a third movie, will turn me around on the ending of this movie. But the idea with the Fremen that Paul is going to be the savior and how they really showed the beliefs of the Fremen and, and, and how they treated Paul as his journey of, as a Fremen individual was, you know, being accepted was going on. I just thought it was so reflective of what we see in everyday society and how religion can be a great thing for people, but also how maybe it cannot be a great thing for people. How like John, like Johnny says, it is a way to control a large population and it is a way to keep them in check or to make sure you can control how they feel or what they do. Um, in the very end of the movie, you, you talk about how, you know, Rebecca Ferguson's Reverend Mother character says, and now the Holy War has begun. What does this consequence mean as Paul and the Fremen are taking on the rest of the galaxy? The power of religion can be very, you know, powerful enough to take down a whole entire Harkonnen kind of family tree and a whole, like, whole, you know, family crest and take back a planet of Arachnus or formerly known as Dune, as we found out in the movie. But is it going to cause lots of death? Is it going to cause lots of harm? Will it be overall good in this movie? And I think when you look at what's paired up with it, and the movie subtly hints it, on the second watch, I think if you pay attention to it, you get a lot more of it. The Bene Jesuit in the background kind of controlling everything religious and not as chess pieces on how they can shape the world. Again, I think is a very good part and theme of this movie. And you really get to see, you know, with comments at the end by the um, the emperor's uh, reverent mother being like, telling lady jessica you think there's a side there really is no side because the truth is paul is just living out something that the benny jesuit was planning on potentially happening at some point did lady jessica maybe make it go quicker than they wanted most likely yes but they had this religious prophecy set in mind so when the time comes and somebody does do it the benny jesuit is kind of has their plans for when that comes to be and I just think that it just highlights some amazing context on, on how religion and just belief in people and social groups can be manipulated and controlled to do good and evil in the world. Now, when I talk about the bad, the very, very bad is the villains. And Fade Rothra is not acted terribly by Austin Butler. I think he does a great job making the character come to life and feel real and you want to get behind him but when i was watching it a second time house harkonnen is some of the most poorly written villains i've seen in a what people call a masterpiece of a movie for everybody out there complaining about mcu villains or villains that are just one note stupid and are just there to be loud and to eventually die that is House Harkonnen in Dune Part 2. And there's things in this movie that I wish they went into more and would be able to give a better perspective overall. And I don't mind like the aim aimlessly killing House Harkonnen soldiers. That's whatever. Every everything's gonna have that sometimes with action sequences. I'm talking about when Fade Rothra is being kind of wooed or being so, you know, uh being seduced by a, a Benny Jesuit. Pre, you know, priestess, and he gets put into that box scenario that we saw Paul in the first movie. We get a little background of, of Fade Roth on how he killed his mother and how he's controlled, but this is a classic trope in movies where I say, show us these things through that box and that interrogation. Don't just tell us after the fact, because I feel like Fade Rothra is somebody who there was so much more that could have been brought out that could have added deeper layers to that character that would have made me find the finale of this be more like memorable overall. Even with the sequence with Fade Rothra, you have this big gladiator fight, and you know Bar the Baron Harkonnen chose not to um, drug one of the Atreides soldiers or Atreides hostages when Fade Rothra was having his birthday gladiator fight. And instead of Fade Rothra being that like, ha, huh, 
I like this challenge. I'm better than this. His first scene after that is whining to the Baron being like, you got me trying to get me killed. I'm going to drown you in your water over here. And he comes off like a prissy teenager that is just so un, like un momentuming the characters like killing any type of interesting momentum i had for him if he came in and being like swaggering with that and it, it didn't bother him and if somebody tried to speak up and he was like no you know the baron was i was happy the baron did that i wish all three of them didn't have any type of drugs with them that would have made, gave me a proper fight good character building moment but he comes out whining like a little bitch to say you know a swear word here. I apologize, but um, and then you look at Batista's character, and he's such a whiny bitch too, and a stupid whiny bitch. You know that the Harkonnens are just here to fail, to look stupid, and to kill their advisors to make them seem menacing. There really isn't much menacing about them per se. When you go and watch the movie and you see them, like you don't even understand how they ended up attacking the Fremen kind of home area up in the northern part of the um, Arachnus world, I would have liked to get a little bit more in-depth. I would have liked to see Fade Mothra's plan and Mothra's plans and how those came into effect. Instead, we just kind of saw him be evil and menacing. and ah, But there was no real depth to his character, which means when at the end of the movie, when Paul is asking if the emperor has a champion when fade rothra jumps up and is like okay cool like yeah yeah you're the bad guy but like you just die you, you there's no stakes to you this fight because you have a zero percent chance of living and it's because the character is written so flatly that it again just illustrates my issues on why this isn't a great movie overall and there's nothing wrong with having villains that are going to fail per se look at lord of the rings with sauron there was no way that was ending with sauron getting a win but you actually have to make some of the villains feel like threats throughout you know to make you get a little tense and not knowing how it's going to end up in certain movies especially like a second movie in a series but because the Harkonnens all got killed off and some of the like and, and didn't do anything well, they're just they're just plain bad written villains. They're everybody's classic hated MCU villain or comic book villain that is just there to die and do everything wrong and be loud. And I just thought that was a very poorly, you know, realized opportunity for Dune Part Two. And again, Austin Butler especially gives a great performance as Fade Rothra with the absolute dog pile of material he is given. And that comes down to the writing. And it makes sense to me because Denis Villeneuve, the director of Dune, Dune Part 1, Dune Part 2, came out this week and talked about how TV is ruining movies because people want dialogue more. And he doesn't think dialogue should be as important as the visuals. And it makes sense when you watch this movie because the visuals are amazing, but some of the writing is subpar. And when you look at some of the best movies of all time, you can have great writing and great dialogue and great visuals. It's not one or the other. The best of the best have both. And while this has some of the best visuals you'll see in movies, it has some of the lackluster dialogue in movies, despite having some very interesting themes and motives without it. And we're not even talking about the fact that Paul... Okay, let's get into Paul Atreides, which I love this first two-thirds, three-quarters of this movie with Paul Atreides, how he was fighting back the idea of this prophecy. He wants to be one in the Fremen. He wants the Fremen to lead themselves. And... He is just doing his best to fit in, to succeed where he can, and to take down the Harkonnens um, as a normal individual. And even though people are giving, you know, as he, he's more and more successful, there's more Fremen that are calling him the prophet, the savior. He's really fighting that idea because he says he can see that this is going to cause massive death. And, and it's going to start a, a type of holy war or something like that. And you see this character struggle throughout. And I really loved that. I loved that theme for most of this movie. But then the final act happens. And 
it was a little bit better and a smudge better the second time I was watching it. Um, but Paul's decision to take the water of life and how he acts after that is such a like breakneck character change that you don't get much insight onto why he's changed like that. It just lost me in a lot of ways. It took this what could have been a I think I would have called a great overall movie and turned it into a good one. I would re relate Paul Atreides going from compassionate leader to straight up dictator, very like in breakneck of a way, as Anakin going from Jedi to, in Revenge of the Sith to. I am going to be a Sith. I am Darth Vader. Like it was not subtle at all. And I know the, the water of life probably helped show him more. And maybe we could have gotten more out of that, but there was like his character just was straight up inauthentic to what he was earlier. I did not feel the Paul Atreides we saw at the end would ever have been the Paul Atreides in the beginning of the movie. And I didn't see an event that came place or a struggle or a belief in him that came place that turned him from that compassionate hero to arrogant dictator. And I think it's something that could have been done if it was given better dialogue, if we were giving one or two scenes, maybe with Paul and Johnny, maybe Paul with, with any of his advisors before the big scene with all the Fremen leaders. I think it could have worked better overall, but he just is this arrogant dictator prick. And maybe then I guess this is where I think that if the next movie comes out and it really highlights the negative parts that Paul has become, I might come back and say like, Hey, this is actually a better movie. It was setting up something else. And I wasn't aware of that, but it spent so much of this movie showing this compassionate individual of Paul Atreides that when we get this monumental shift in tone and demeanor and everything, I just felt it wasn't subtle. It wasn't even like well put together. It was just like, Oh, he's all seeing now. He's a prophet. He can see everything. So he's just going to be a douchebag. And then we're going to even talk about the reveal that he was a Harkonnen. His mom was the daughter of the, you know, the, you know, Baron Harkonnen and how that to me felt like an inconsequential, th inconsequential thing. Like, Maybe again in the next movie, it'll be explored more. But this movie, I don't think there's a point to that. I don't think it adds to the story overall. And if it was supposed to, they didn't do it in a well enough way that I think it deserved to be in there or it really needed to be in there. It just was like, oh, cool. Yeah, okay. So their bloodlines mix. Oh, it's family on family. Oh, like that's going to change the fact that the Harkonnens killed his dad who he beloved and so much the people that he loved. It was like a pointless thing to put in there again. Maybe they could have built more of that. And I think there was a line of dialogue that they could have built on, but if you actually like, give us a couple more lines, give us a scene where maybe he's like, I'm going to be a Harkonnen now and I have to be like a Harkonnen to make, the, you know, to make the world right. And that would have been better. But again, it was just breakneck's character shifting. And it was just something that I did not personally love overall. Um, as far as third acts go too, you get some action sequences in that fight, but so much of the third act was like HBO called Denny Villeneuve and was like, Hey, um, yeah, we're not going to have the budget for this third act fight. You can do a couple scenes like for like 20 or so seconds, but like, yeah, no extended fight. In fact, Paul will just walk in there and the guard will get killed off screen. And yeah, 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 yeah. We're not going to show any of like the real action and fight, you know, and then we'll give Josh Brolin and Dave Batista a little bit of a fight type aftermath thing. But like, again, hold the budget a bit. We can't really afford to show this grand fight overall. It did was underwhelming a bit because I feel like they were building up to this huge fight. You see all these numbers. You see everything going on. You have the beautiful visual that you've seen in the trailers of, I believe, a nuke blowing up a mountain and the emperor ship in the background. And it's just like you get a couple scenes, you get into it, then you get to the emperor's palace area and pull him, and some of his crew just you know walk in after the emperor sends out some of his most elite guard. 
you don't even hear them scream or suffer. They just kind of like go mute and Paul walks in with, with some of his soldiers and it's just like the budget went away. Like the, the movie's beautiful and I understand the need of, of holding budgets back, but like the budget clearly went away <laughs> or somebody told them this movie was too long and you should cut this out, which could have happened too. But like it was noticeable for me. And I'm not somebody who likes to say action is important, but like this would be like if the two towers where, where the minute, like half of the battle was just not seen. It was like a couple arrows. They went inside. They Gandalf came and they came back out and it was like done in five minutes. That's how Dune part two's battle sequence at the end kind of goes. And I know it's a different type of battle sequence per se, but like, Come on, like no excuses for that in terms of like it, I think it's a legitimate criticism, and it just makes just for me it makes it kind of comedic in terms of how just late, horrible these these fighting people are like the em- emperor's like supreme soldiers, uh, yeah. Just I I did not like that. I think it was and when I watched it the second time, I was like, holy smokes. They wrapped up that so quick because it's like, got to get to the end. Don't have the budget to show the nice big fight. We used all of that on the worm riding, which the worm riding was great. But like, H, I guess HBO just didn't, you know, Warner Brothers didn't have either the, you know, and it makes sense. If you look at Warner Brothers movies recently, they have lost a lot of money. They're canceling, you know, a couple of movies every year, it feels like, to try and get write-offs. I imagine this movie did get cut off in some budget and that's why the third act fight was just over. You got like a Chani, uh, a Chani action sequence and then you got Paul going in. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Um, but yeah, so th- those are the things. And when I talk about movies that, and people commented on my non spoil review. There are movies out there that is being this is being compared to as an all time great, and I just don't think it handled the characters well enough. I didn't even talk about the princess and the emperor yet because, you know, the princess is kind of there as just like a Benny Jesuit mouthpiece and kind of explaining what happened in the first movie and like half explaining what's going on in this movie, um, but there isn't much there. Um, Christopher Walken as the emperor is just there. You don't get to know too much of what they're thinking. Pretty much all you know is like they're kind of controlled by the Benny Jesuit, and that's it. And again, like I said with the villains, like plain noted, bad, evil. Batista, one of his worst acting performances I've seen in a long while. Just not good. Uh, it didn't branch out on characters all that much and the around it didn't world build in my opinion well enough like they're going to attack the other houses at the end of this movie but we have no idea who those people are they were just rumored to show up at the very end of the movie those are things you can build in with the emperor and some other people throughout this movie was just sloppily world built in some ways outside of the fremen and when I think of great movies like Lord of the Rings, you know, King, you know, Return of the King and Two Towers, even Fellowship, there's characters that are, especially Two Towers, you have Frodo, Smeagol, and Sam being built up. You're having Gandalf the White kind of be introduced and shown. Merry and Pippin have their own arc. Um, Gimli and Legolas kind of have their own arc. Even Saruman has his little own arc per se that I can understand better. And, Air, you know, Aragorn is this, you know, you understand his journey so much more from first movie and then the second movie, learning his lineage and what he, who he is and his emotional turmoils. When you look at, say, The Dark Knight, you get Christian Bale, you know, as Batman's perspective. Even like Michael Caine as Alfred, you understand his point of view and his character being built up. Um, you have, you know, the, the detective being built up. Heath Ledger as the Joker, you understand his motivations throughout. Even some of the other criminals that are trying to use the Joker and failing to because his motivations don't line up with them. 
Let's not even talk about Harvey Dent and his whole storyline. Characters built out more. Um, Return of the Je you know, the uh, Emperor Strikes Back. People are calling this better than the Emperor Strike Back. You got so much good with Darth Vader. He, yes, he was kind of had the same kind of killing his advisors, but he also didn't kill them right away. He didn't have that upset. He had a more menacing tone. He was more thoughtful. He was playing a, a smart game. You had Han Solo and Leia's connection be built up more and tell their kind of love story to be. You had Luke learning things from Yoda and introducing just Yoda as a character. There's so many movies that are amazingly great out there that this is being compared to that just world build and character build these actually good characters and is able to spread the love throughout all of them that this movie wasn't able to do. Yes, it got Shawnee very well right. Yes, Lady Jessica and Stilgar was done very right, in my opinion. But And then Paul, I think for the most part, I would give a positive to. But outside of those four, everybody else, I felt, was just rushly written with very little to talk about in the background. And it just did not live up to the highest of high expectations. Now, that's not to say that this movie wasn't great. It is to say this movie wasn't great. This movie was very good. I enjoyed it. The action was great. The sound was great. The visuals are great. The story, the dialogue, the writing fell short for me. And for me as an individual, that is the important part. I want these characters not to be bland in some ways. And while a lot of the characters up front in term, from Paul's perspective that he was close to worked decently well, there are so many other characters that I thought were bland and boring. Even Josh Rowland's character, I was like, he was just there so that he can find the nukes for Paul Atreides and kill Batista's character. Besides that, there wasn't anything added to him. He wasn't interested in the heaven there. In fact, he was more of an annoyance for me on the screen. And that's not Josh Brolin's acting. That's just how the character was written. And it's just, yeah. Those are my spoiler thoughts on Dune Part 2. Tell me what things you loved about the movie down below. Tell me the things that I've gotten wrong in your opinion. And tell me some of the stuff you got right in your opinion. Again, I think this is a good movie. I think it's a very good movie. It wasn't even in my top three movies of February that I saw. And that's okay. But a lot of people are coming at me and are telling me this is a great movie. And I love that for them. But for me, this is just a good movie. And I would say there's going to be a lot of people who I think feel the same way. Because even in my second showing, somebody tried to applause like I've had after some really great films and they did like the awkward, like three claps, nobody else clapped in. So they stopped. I think again, beautiful movie. I don't need to see this again. I've seen it two times. I did the second time cause I could do the spoiler review, but that's Dune too. We'll see an award season next year, but award season this year isn't over. So be ready for my Oscar predictions and my last couple wrap up why some of the nomination wouldn't best picture and maybe even a fun video where I do a little acting myself. But until then like, and subscribe to this channel and I'll see you next time.